Welcome to this service at Faith and Victory Church. This is the place to come to receive your miracle from God. Now, let's join our service already in progress. Well, so we were in Romans 3. And remember, Romans chapter 2 was talking about, um, we kind of started out the very first chapter, the need for righteousness. Then we got into the fact that the Gentiles were under sin. Then you move over in chapter 2 for, uh, through the third, the eighth verse of chapter 3 that the Jews were under sin. And then after that, the whole world's under sin. So, we're, you know, it's like, you know, okay, Jews don't think you guys are cool because, you know, you're, you're, you got this stuff. You're under sin too. Gentiles were already under sin. Of course, the Jews already knew that. They already considered the, the uh, Gentiles to be under sin. And then Paul concludes after that, Everybody's under sin. You know, we can start in verse 9. He said, what then are we better than they? No, in no wise. Um, for we have, uh, pr pr have proved, before proved both Jews and Gentiles that they're all under sin. As it is written. Then he goes on. And now this passage of scripture is used many, many times to talk about that, you know, we say, well, I'm the righteousness of God in Christ. People say, no, there's none righteous, no, not one. Well, you know, again, be good Bible students going to be a good Bible student, you find out why it was written, who it was written to, when it was written, and where it was written, putting the parameters around it, and what was being said. You just can't pull, there's none righteous, no, not one out, when somebody says, I'm the righteousness of God in Christ. Because 2 Corinthians 5, 17 says, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Verse 21 says, he, he was made sin that we might uh, be made the righteousness of God in him. So the scriptures that are, that are counter Two, there's none righteous, none that one. Why did Paul wait, write that? He's talking about, look at the theme he's talking about here. All are under sin. Now understand, Paul is building a case to lead us to something. Right. Amen? He's building a case that the Jews, under, that the Gentiles are under sin, the Jews are under sin, Daniels come together, we're all under sin. And he goes on and says, there's none righteous. Now, in other words, he's kind of talking to the Jews a little bit about being cocky about the fact that they got the natural lineage of Abraham. Okay? And so he goes on and says, none righteous, no, not one, none that understandeth. There's none that seeketh after God. They're all gone out of the way. They're all together become unprofitable. There's none that doeth good, no, not one. Didn't the Bible say that we're created in Christ Jesus unto good works? So he's, talk, he's not talking about uh, something post-Christ. He's talking about something before you come to Jesus. Amen. Um, <clears throat> their throat is an open sepulcher. With their tongues they have used deceit, the uh, poison of asp is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness, their feet are swift to shed blood, destruction and misery are in their ways, and the way of peace have they not known. There is no fear before God, uh, of God before their eyes. Now we know that whatsoever, see, now see, Paul just quoted that, and he goes and says this, now we know that whatsoever the law saith, it saith to them that are under the law. In other words, you know, uh, this is stated that even if you're under the law and there's a way of, uh, there's a promissory note of salvation under the law to the Jew or to the converted Jew under the old covenant, that it was, these things were spoken to them. Even though you've got a promissory note, you're still all these things. Okay. All right. It saith to them that are under the law that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. Why? So that everybody has to come to a saving faith through Jesus Christ and not through the works of the law. That's what he's after. He's, he's bringing them to this point. It doesn't matter how cool. It doesn't matter if you washed your face, if you fasted, if you traveled, if you gave all your offerings, if you went with the, 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 uh, all the free will offerings and all the uh, required offerings, the voluntary and the involuntary offerings, if you gave the meal and the, you know, and the trespass and the sin and, you know, and all the different offerings you had to offer, you did all those things and you kept every point of the law, you are still guilty before God. And, the only, and then Paul is going to bring us to this point in this letter to Rome. That when, and in that state, when we reach that state and we come to that acknowledgement, there is one that has come to redeem us. Glory to God. Glory. Hallelujah. <clears throat> Amen. That the world may be guilty before God. Therefore, by the deeds of the law shall no flesh be what? Justified. Hallelujah. Or declared righteous in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. But now, oh, praise God. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. I'm glad Paul didn't pass away and go on to heaven before he got to this verse. Right. 
Hallelujah. Because they would have got that and they would have, I mean, we'd be teaching all kinds of stuff in our churches right now. Paul wrote that much, man. That must have been something good there. We don't know what else we was going to say. I'm glad he stayed around and got the rest of it out. <laughs> Hallelujah. But now, the righteousness of God without the law is manifest. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Being witnessed, how? Being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Remember Paul wrote in one place and said this, that the law was given as a schoolmaster to do what? Bring us to Christ. And here he says that the righteousness of God without the law has been manifest and it's witnessed by the law and the prophets. The Bible talks about the prophets. They, they long for our day. They long to live in the time of grace, glory to God. The time when you could, by, by faith, receive the grace of God and be declared righteous in this life. Remember the Old Testament saints, when they died, did not go to heaven. They went to Abraham's bosom, awaiting for the promise. Hallelujah. Remember the Bible says this, that when Jesus died on the cross, it said he went and preached unto the captives. Oh, my. What a day. Can't you imagine David down there with Abraham and the whole bunch? Hallelujah. In the upper region of the, of, of the departed, hell, or, or gain, I, can't, I, I, I know I, mis, I just mutilated that, but anyway, divided into two compartments, the, the, uh, the region of the damned, and then Abraham's bosom, and all those who died righteously under the old covenant went into Abraham's bosom awaiting the day that the promised Messiah would come and complete that work and that promise of God to redeem mankind. That promise given in Genesis chapter 3 verse 15 where he said to Satan that the seed, uh, the serpent will bruise his heel but the seed of the woman will bruise your head. He's going to strip you of your authority. Glory to God. There was a day coming that all the prophets knew about. How Hallelujah. They, hallelujah. David died. Abraham died. Moses died. All of them died knowing that there was one coming who was going to bruise the head of the serpent. Glory to God. Amen. 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 And so they're, they're down there just waiting. When you think it's going to happen, Abe, I don't know, but it's a coming. Hey, look over at Moses. Well, you saw him up, you know, you saw him. Hallelujah. What do you think? I, it's a coming. As a matter of fact, I just got back with a visit with him. Up on the Mount of Transfiguration. It's not a long way off, praise God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And can't you imagine the joy in Abraham's bosom? Hallelujah. When they looked across that gulf and they saw one walking who was the son of the living God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And he came and stood before him. Hallelujah. He said that David, he said, I'm the Lord that I'm the Lord that you said unto my Lord. He said to the prophets, I'm the wheel within, Ezekiel, I'm the wheel within the wheel, hallelujah. I'm Jacob's ladder, glory to God. I'm the angel of the covenant, glory be to God. Amen. Hallelujah. David, David, who had danced before the ark of the covenant, just took off a dancing again, hallelujah. Amen. He came and said, I am the first, the last, the alpha, <coughs> the alpha, the omega, the beginning and the end. I am the one who was and is and is to come. And the Bible says he led captivity captive. Amen. Satan had to watch as the upper regions emptied out. Hallelujah. So a couple of them got so excited that when they came back, as they, as they came through on the way to, to, for, for, to be received into heaven, they picked up the body <laughs> and went and told some folks. Go read it in Matthew. Some of the old saints came out of the grave and went into the city and were seen of many. Oh, glory to God. See, we just couldn't wait. We had to tell you. Hallelujah. He's come. Glory to God. Hallelujah. We're no, living, no longer we living under that law. We're going to be living under a righteousness that's received by faith. Glory to God. Hallelujah. What we long to live in. You get to walk in. We preached about it. We prophesied about it. We foretold about it. Glory be to God. But he has come. And now you. And your generations and the generations that follow you 
could walk in what we could only see. A righteous man, a woman, clothed in flesh, walking the earth again. Hallelujah. I said, oh, put the, make you want to do the, what we call, the Pentecostal chicken. The God. Hallelujah. Make you say, help me, Jesus. Help me. Amen. Amen. I grew up Pentecostal. I'm not to do it. <laughs> Hallelujah. I ain't going to hurt myself. <laughs> you show me what you can do. Yeah, come on. <laughs> go call you right out. <laughs> but now the righteousness of God without the law is what? Manifest. Now I grew up, we used to sing the song, when we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. When we all see Jesus, we'll sing and shout the victory. My God, he said, now it's manifest. He said, now. He said over in Deuteronomy that we would have days of heaven on the earth. Glory to God. There's just nothing to dance about. Glory to God. I don't have to wait to get to heaven to shout. Hallelujah. I can experience that righteousness right now. I can shout right now. Hallelujah. But now, the righteousness of God, which is by faith. Yeah, that's that faith stuff. Yeah, but God has dealt to every man the measure of faith. By faith of Jesus Christ. Unto all and upon all them that Believe, here is Paul's thesis that the Jew and the Gentile are condemned under sin, but with faith in Jesus Christ, whether you're a Jew or whether you're a Gentile, the righteousness of God is manifest in you now. Amen? For well, there is no difference. What a thesis. Let me tell you something. This is the thesis of the entire new covenant. It doesn't matter who you are, where you came from, what your natural lineage is, what your spiritual lineage is, that in Jesus Christ you are made one, you are made righteous by faith in him. Everything about the new covenant revolves around whosoever believes. Whosoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Amen. Glory to God. Amen. He says this, you know, for there's no difference for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. How many times you hear that preacher, they don't preach verse 24? Yeah. My God. Yeah, I know we've all sinned. We've all come short of the glory of God. That's only half the thesis. Give the rest of it. Right. I said give the rest of it. What's that? Being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Ooh, that'll make you shout. That'll make a Baptist shout. That'll make a Presbyterian run. Hallelujah. And might get a Pentecostal filled with the Holy Ghost. Some of them need to get filled again. Amen. Here we are, all declared guilty, all declared unworthy, all declared, whether you're a Jew or a Greek, without God. But Jesus has come. And there is a righteousness now that you cannot earn by bringing turtle doves and bullocks. And, you know, what, what, what does the Bible say? For the blood of bulls and goats, over in Hebrews chapter 9, or the sprinkling of the ashes of a heifer, sanctified to the purifying of the flesh. I love the way Paul would do stuff. I believe Paul wrote Hebrews, by the way. I wonder, wonder who, boop, 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 who wrote the book of Hebrews. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> but here it's stated, the, the blood of bulls and goats, the sprinkling of ashes of a heifer would sanctify your flesh. But then it goes on and says this, how much more? How much more? 
Let's do a little preacher's wife. Ha! I need me a choir back here, you know. Hallelujah. I mean Hammond B3 with a Leslie. Glory to God. And somebody know how to play it. Hallelujah. Amen. How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, cleanse or purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? See, every year they can get their, 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 get their flesh sanctified. But there was always a remembrance of sin. Hallelujah. But one came greater than a bull. One came greater than the goats. One came greater than the heifers. One came called the son of the living God. Hallelujah. Referred to as the firstborn from the dead. Hallelujah. The firstborn of many brethren. Glory be to God. He came and sprinkled his blood. And he entered in once and all for all to obtain the eternal redemption for us. And now we live in a covenant. Paul has brought us here in chapter 3. He's brought us from, the, you know, we're all lost. We're all without hope. But now, not, not when we get to heaven, not when we stand before God's throne, but right now is manifest the righteousness of God in us by our faith in Jesus Christ. Whom God, talking about Jesus, has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood, to declare his righteousness for the remissing, remission of sins. Now, my, my margin says, the Greek says, the passing over. Remember under the old covenant, on the day on Passover, they would went and put the blood on the doorpost and on the lentils. And, if, and when the death angel came, when it saw the blood, they would, it would pass over. And that's what that's, that Greek word here is, is, it may, it actually says that. It makes reference to that. That when you're under the blood of Jesus, Hallelujah. There's power. We don't want to talk about the blood anymore. Oh, that makes us heathenistic. There's one denomination that took all the songs with blood in it out of their hymnals. Because they said it was, it, was, it was heathenistic and it was barbaric. Oh, I want you to know, glory be to God, on the doorpost and the lintel of your life, praise God, the blood of Jesus has been applied. Hallelujah. And, it, and, when, and, and, the, and judgment passes over. When you're under the blood, Mark Hankins, blood, make you feel righteous. Y'all go hear some Mark Hankins sermons. You like the way he preached. To declare the remission of the passing over sins that are passed through the, through the forbearance of God. To declare, remember we said that word forbearance meant? That God withheld judgment for a season, given the opportunity for repentance. I mean, God could have cooked us a long time ago, but his forbearance with pushed that back so that people could come under the blood. Oh, glory to God. Though your red, sins be red as scarlet, hallelujah, or crimson, they'll be made white as snow, hallelujah. Red blood on red sin, make it white. How's that work? I don't know, but it works. Hallelujah. Red plus red equal white. In redemption terms, he said through the forbearance or the staying of his judgment to declare at this time his righteousness that he might be just and the justifier of him that believeth in Jesus. How many believe in Jesus? Then the justifier has justified you. Where is boasting then? It's excluded. Now, and again, remember, he's been talking to the Jews here some. Because they say, well, remember, you may, he goes to one place and says, you may say we have Abraham to our father. That's not good enough. Abraham's faith is to be mimicked because he believed God. He did not obtain what he obtained by the works of the law. He did it by the working of faith. But where is boasting? Jews, you don't have anywhere to boast. Remember, he started out this chapter, what advantage of the Jew have, um, you know. And then Paul says, you got a lot. But then he goes on and says, but what advantage do you have? None. Amen. I'm sorry, what advantage, he starts out with what advantage do you have? 
But then he comes back later and he says, uh, what the, I want to see, make sure I word it right. Where, you know, uh, mm-hmm. we got verse 9, are we better than they? We have an advantage because we got all the law and the covenants and we have the headers, but are we um, better? Nope. Because you're, you're, you're condemned by the same law without faith. Where is boasting then? It's excluded. You don't have where to boast. By what law? Of works? No. By the law of faith. Therefore we conclude. If people would read the whole thing instead of just stopping that where, where it, it sounds good to their sermon, it'd be be, we'd be better off. Instead of getting up here and preaching, there is none righteous, no, not one. I want you to tell you everybody here is sinners, you're going to hell. I mean, I well, if you're born again, you're not. And then so, let's, think, let's find out what Paul's conclusion was. That's a better conclusion than mine or yours. Amen? Therefore, we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. Is he the God of the Jews only? Is he not of the Gentiles? Yes, of the Gentiles also. Seeing it is the, uh, one God which shall justify the circumcision by faith and the uncircumcision through faith. Do we make the law void through faith? God forbid, yea, we establish the law. Because all the things that the law demanded that you do and people did in the flesh, they could never live up to it. But through faith in Jesus Christ, one has come and fulfilled the law. We now establish that the law is true and the law is good and the law is pure and the law is holy. You go, and I got some bozos running around out there with big ministries saying, if we could just do away with the Old Testament, we'd be better off. Yet the Bible calls the Old Testament law holy. It simply pointed out what we could, uh, what God demanded, and you could not achieve it in the flesh. And so, because you could not achieve it in the flesh, He sent one to fulfill it, and through faith in Him. You, you appropriate his completed work. The law is holy. When God said, you know, not to lust after your neighbor's wife, that is a holy commandment. Amen. It doesn't mean because you're in the grace you can lust after your neighbor's wife. Amen. That's not what it means. Grace does not mean that you can use the name of the Lord God in vain. That commandment is still holy. Thank you for your enthusiasm. The other 3,000 plus ordinances that God gave, there are reasons for them. And unless, unless he changed them, they're, st they, they're still whole. Remember this, um, we weren't supposed to eat scavengers and different types of animals. And then Jesus, uh, uh, I mean, Peter had that vision that all manner of beasts were shown. And, and uh, the Lord said, rise, Peter, kill thee. He said, not so, Lord, nothing unclean has ever crossed my lips. He said, what the Lord has cleansed, thou shalt not call unclean. Go back and study. You'll find out that historically they didn't have the right techniques to be able to cook some of those things so they weren't poisonous or dangerous. Pork, you know, you got to cook pork to a certain temperature and get it thoroughly cooked or it, it, can, it can be uh, very dangerous to you physically. How many are glad? Hallelujah. When Pastor Ed said that this week we're having Eastern Carolina barbecue. Hallelujah. We cook it, we cook it right, we get it, we get her done, baby. Hallelujah. I become Larry the Cable Guy. We get her done. <laughs> Hallelujah. The Lord cleansed it because, because over time they were able to create ways to cook things thoroughly. Okay? But if, so God, some of God's dietary laws were for their protection, not because he didn't want them ever to do that. And as a matter of fact, he comes back later and says, what I've cleansed, you don't call it unclean. Now, it was symbolic in reference to the Gentiles, but he used that, so he, he, he couldn't use that and not do both of them. Right. Amen. So pork is clean. Hallelujah. I cooked me a, a, a couple of Boston butts a couple of weeks ago. Took it, to, took it to the beach, gave it to my parents, took it over to my brother's house, gave it to him, and everybody was, I mean, whoo! They had to clean the ceiling. They were just slapping it everywhere. Glory to God. 
Nathan couldn't sleep because he ate so much. Do we make void the law through faith? No. God, he says here, we establish it. People who come back and just all of a sudden want to go back and say, we, we don't need the Old Testament. The Old Testament don't mean anything. Really, go through your New Testament and look how many times that the New Testament refers to the Scriptures. And guess what they're talking about? Anywhere you see in the New Testament that it's referring to the Scriptures, as the Scriptures say, it's talking about the Old Testament. And then you get preachers come on saying we don't need the Old Testament. Paul did. Peter did. Jesus did. Amen. Amen. Don't be dumb. They go like one woman told uh, Brother Hagin's preacher to say, you know, that, you know, the Greek says this and the Greek said that. She came up to him after the service and she said, now I want to tell you one thing, that if the King James was good enough for the Apostle Paul, it's good enough for me. See, that's where you just need to keep your mouth shut. Then we won't know how stupid you are. <laughs> the King James was good enough for the Apostle Paul. It's good enough. You got people in this country who wear hats. KJV. 1611. KJV. Meaning what? That they only read the 1611 version of the King James Bible. And I'm going to tell you something. That's, that's, what we have now is not the original 1611 version because the language is so uh, antiquated. It's been changed to update words that we can pronounce and not go, huh? You start reading the 1611 King James Version and, and you know, we might have to pray for you. Because you'll be going, what? Anybody ever tried to read Wycliffe? Sheesh. It's like, okay, guys, put the I where the Y is so we can read it. I mean, it's really weird to read that one. The law is established by our faith, not done away with. Hello? Meaning what? My life of faith in Jesus is fulfilling the dictates and demands of the law. The law is fulfilled by my life of faith, not done away with. I'm able not to lust after my neighbor's wife, not as an exercise of the flesh, but because I'm walking in Jesus. And so I'm not free to lust after my neighbor's wife. I'm, I mean, I'm not free to lust after my neighbor's wife. I've been made free by being in him from lusting after my neighbor's wife. My faith walk keeps me out of that place. Let me say this. It's not automatic. You have to exercise your faith. Amen. Right. Hello? My faith walk has made me free from the power of the flesh to obey it and the lust thereof. I've now been made free to, to follow my spirit and to live according to the plan of God. I still have to do it. If any man be a hearer and not a doer, He's deceived. Whoever heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them not, I will liken him unto. What? That's what Jesus said. You get people get born again, they come in and go, well, the Bible says this, about I don't have to do any of that. Jesus said, I will tell you what, if you hear the word and you don't do it, you're like you're building your house on sand. Why? Because you're setting yourself up for failure if you're not a doer of the word. The doers of the word are the ones who dug deep and went down to the rock and they put their foundation in the rock, glory to God. And when, I mean, folks, I'm telling you, some of this teaching on, uh, the, the, the extreme crazy teaching on grace that people are doing, that it doesn't matter what I do, God don't care, I don't have to do anything, I'm under grace, it's stupid because what you're doing, you're building your house on sand. And here's, here's the thing, look at the analogy that Jesus gave us when he said, he that heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them not, I will liken him into a man who builds his house on the sand. And the storm comes and the winds blow and the rain falls and the stream beats upon it and what? Great is the fall. But the man who heareth them and doeth them. Now, now think about this now. Externally, and this is where people, people just get shh, shh, misguided that sounds better than stupid doesn't it okay I was gonna say stupid but I'm not gonna say stupid I say misguided which means stupid anyway 
When they build the house on the wrong foundation externally, it looks like the house that's built on the right foundation. And you may walk in the house that's on the wrong foundation and walk around, look at all the beauty and the sheetrock and all the ornaments of, of, of all the stuff and everything, and it's just, it looks just like the house next door that was built on the rock. Right. See, the houses were built by the same stream. The houses endured and went through and countered the same storm, the same winds, the same rain, the same beating of the stream or, or, or you know, river and water. It wasn't until the storms came that it was revealed that one was built on the wrong foundation. So people, when people come along and start, and ministers start coming along and telling you, it doesn't matter what you do. You don't have to obey the word. You don't have to do the word. You don't have to do this, that, that, and, this, and all this stuff and tell you you don't have to obey this and you don't have to do that. Remember, Jesus said, he who hears these sayings of mine and doeth them not. He's the one that built it on the sand. He that hears them and does them, he built it on the rock. And only, only, everybody say, only, only. <coughs> the storms of life will reveal how you build it. And until then, you won't know. You can move into a house that's built on the wrong foundation and just live in that and think, well, this is wonderful, it's awesome, glorious, and then the storm show up and it falls. Right. And people around you will think you're a great man or woman of faith and living under the grace of God, and you're this, 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 and this. And they'll be wondering, why did they fall when the storm came? The worst kind of deception is self-deception. Go to James chapter one, uh, 2. We're going to close here. 1. We're going to close right here. I know we're leaving Romans. We'll be back here next week. Paul is Paul's still over in um, Corneth. He's still writing, so we'll, we'll get back to him. Paul, I mean, James writes to the church in verse 21 of chapter 1 and says, Wherefore lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of knowledge and receive with meekness the engrafted the word which is able to save sozo your soul, your suke, not your spirit. He's talking to church folk. He's talking to born again believers. He's not talking. See, these new preachers are coming along and, and they, they, they say, I was walking through my house all day and the Lord told me such and such. And they don't give you any scripture. The Lord told me. And you can go find 10 scriptures that refutate it. But if you don't believe what the Lord told them, you're stupid or dumb or faithless. Right. Well, I'll take, I'll take any of those over just because what the Lord told you. When I got scripture that combats it. Right. Hello? I'm under grace. I don't have to lay down superfluity and not into the flesh because I'm not controlled by them. I'm under grace. But he, why did James tell him to do it then? If he told you to do it, there's a reason. And then receive with meekness the engrafted word of God, which they were to save, sozo, restore, make whole, make sound your soul. Suke. Your, not your pneuma, your soul, your suke. Listen to this next verse. But be doers of the word. I remember I've told you this. I had a discussion with a girl on, on a, a Facebook chat a couple, three years ago maybe four years ago now, and she said, I don't have to do anything. I don't have to tithe. I don't have to go to church. I don't have to give. I don't have to obey. I don't have to submit. And then she just went on list of all the things she didn't have to do because she was under grace. Well, the Bible says be doers of the word. And the Bible tells you to submit, to obey, to attend church, to give, to tithe. New Testament. Amen. So all the things you're saying you don't have to do because you're under grace, the Bible says be a doer of the word, and the word says do all those things. So who am I going to take? I'm going to take Bible over your stupidity, Amen. your misguidedness. Listen with this, but be doers of the word and not hearers only. Why? Deceiving your own selves. When you hear it and you don't obey and do it, you become deceived. 
For if any be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he's like a man who beholds uh, his, um, unto a man beholding his natural face in a glass. For he beholdeth himself and goeth his way and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he is. Let me tell you something. There's a lot of people out there thinking they're cool with God. Everything's hunk dory Everything's wonderful. Because they, they fall into this thing that they're under a grace that it doesn't matter. And the Bible says that when you leave the word, you forget who you are. That's what the Bible says. When you leave the word, you forget who you are. But whoso looketh look into the perfect law of liberty and content, continueth therein and being not a forgetful hearer but a doer of the W-O-R-K. Work! This man shall be blessed in his deed. Wow. Yeah, remember, that, remember this? The commands of the Lord are not grievous. He said, come unto me, all you that labor and heavy laden, I'll give you rest. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. He didn't say you wouldn't have one. You wouldn't be, he didn't say you wouldn't be yoked. And he didn't say you wouldn't have a burden. But he said it's going to be easy and light. Why? Because you're walking with the word. The word empowers you to carry the burden and walk in the, you see, when you're yoked with the word, you can carry the burden in victory. Right. Whatever the enemy throws against you, you can carry out in victory. Right. You can live victorious over. Because you're yoked with the word. The word has the answer. Amen? Amen. Praise God. We're going to stop right there. How many enjoyed that? We trust that you were blessed by the word of God and the flow of the spirit of God in this service. If you would like to contact us, please write us via email at office at fbc.org or using our mailing address, P.O. Box 7752, Greensboro, North Carolina, 27417. If you would like to contribute to our ministry, please go to our website at www.fbc.org and click on the giving online button. Thank you, and may God richly bless you for your giving.